things, right? So you can't follow me, see some interruptions and so forth, right? You guys kind of get that. So that's what the homologous column means, right? So as much as you have like inputs, whether it's descending, right? Or straight in from cerebellum, mesencephalon, if you will, and onto the nuclei, right? right? So you have that mix. Now go further with that. So brain develops in a rostral, caudal, proximal, distal order, right? It also develops in prefrontal cortex from right to left. Fair enough? So when you say that the child is born, the child is usually born in what motor position? Flexion. So therefore, the more immature brain is, the more what dominant your patient is? Flex. So therefore, what's one of the very first functions of developing frontal lobe? Right side. Say again? Good. So lift the head, or what we might say is postural tone. Fair enough? So one of the very first things a child is going to do as brain develops is to do what? To raise their head and develop a postural tone. So we can look at the child from the standpoint of their ability to hold their head, right, as a sign of what? Clinically. Developmental delay, right? If the child is delayed in motor milestones, then they'll also be delayed in what? Cognitive milestones, right? So for you as a chiropractor, when you have a child who is a special needs child, why would they need chiropractic care? Don't they need behavioral therapy? Don't they need cognitive training? Don't they need to sit in a chair all day and have speech classes? Why not? Because basic science tells you very easily how to order your care plan, right? So in other words, as you look at brain developing postural tone, and we study the lateral and medial vestibular spinal pathways, those pathways convey motor efferent information to what? Spine and legs. So you are designed by the fact of being bipedal to have the predominance of your afferent input to neurological systems coming from where? So how healthy is your brain when you do this all day? So how many times do you crack their neck, pull their fingers before they all of a sudden stand up? <coughs> Okay? Just pull the nail with a pair of pliers, right? So you guys get that? So in other words, what's the antithesis of brain function? This classroom. Right? In other words, if you want to reduce your brain health, this is what it would look like. Yes? In other words, brain rolls John Medina, right? Fairly well. That's why you now have what's called the sitting disease. It's not just sitting, it's now called what? A disease. We as Americans simply do what? Sit too much. Right? You can sit, but we do what? Sit too much. So what do you then observe in your pyramidal system when you have diminished afferent input to DC motor pathways? You see a return to what? To fetal posturing. So watch what happens here. So brain tells you, embryology tells you, you are first born in what? Flex posture, the fetal position, right? But that's a sign of immaturity of brain or lack of development, right? So as the brain starts to receive input primarily from somatic systems, so parietal lobe, right? Areas of problem 3, 3B, 1, and 2. Motor cortex is what? Area 4. Where was area 5? Parietal. Where was 6? Frontal. Where was 7? Parietal. Where is 8? Nine and ten, frontal eye fields, right? So it goes parietal frontal. It doesn't go auditory visual. So even though you see the little stroller that has an iPad attachment for it, that is still not okay. Because what does the developing brain need first and foremost in those first few days of life, if you will? Say again. Okay, one more time. Parietal frontal. Touch, touch, movement, right? It's when mom holds a child. If you've ever watched a, a new mom, she holds a child as what? And see, as mom is moving, what's happening to the canals and the otoliths of the sacral neutral? See, this is cannular. You see this? And what is this? Utricular, right? And it's the output of the utricular system that drives the vestibular sympathetic reflex 
which modulates cardiopulmonary function. Right? Yes, no? You with me? Okay, just be honest. Have you studied the vestibular sympathetic reflex? Okay, that's embryology. That's anatomy. That's physiology. So no? Okay. So it might be worthwhile, right? Because as we talk about the first thing brain does is to, hang with me, okay? Is first of all to begin to inhibit flexors, right? While activating what? Extensors for bipedalism. Then bipedalism is what allows you to have the weight bearing after an input to then drive cerebellum, parietal, and frontal activations. Fair enough? So we've got a brain that has to be activated, doesn't it? How much activation do you have of your ankle when sitting during class all day? Not a whole lot. How about your knees? And your hips? So let me guess. You sit on your ischial tuberosity, right? Or is that just trivia for a test question? Because most of you probably sit somewhere about L4, L5 spinous. <laughs> yes? Right? Okay. Now, the very next thing is, what's infant respiratory rate, cardiac rate? Cardiac rate 130, 140. Respiratory rate 40 to 60. Again, basic what? Embryology. Embryology being applied to clinical practice, right? Yes? So then what's the next thing brain does, especially through frontal lobe, through frontopontine projections, then ponto major tick formation? In other words, what's your heart right now? Is your heart rate 130, 160? No. So what is frontopontine projections doing? <coughs> Activating, not activating parasympathetics. Keep in mind, does not activate parasympathetic. It only does what? In other words, output expression nucleus ambiguous is cardio what? Inhibitory. So what you do is you spend your time inhibiting sympathetics. You do not activate them. And you as clinicians have to make very clear that you understand what it means to inhibit sympathetics and then to activate parasympathetics. Just because you reduce someone's sympathetic stimulation doesn't mean you, by default, activate their parasympathetics. You clear on that? Very, very important. So these same pathways don't stimulate parasympathetics, but they inhibit what? Sympathetics, okay? So then what does it mean when you have your patient put their hands up like this and open and close, open and close, open and close? What are we doing? We're feeling for them to do what? Claudicate. For them to have slowness on one side, aren't we? You get that? And so if they claudicate, let's say on the left side, what do we know about the PMRF on the left side? Okay, in other words, what does it mean to claudicate? If you think about claudication, everybody kind of familiar with that term? Okay, well, thank you, because if you're not, say something, don't let me keep going on, okay? So claudication means you've got decreased fuel. You have vasomotor constriction, you have ischemia. So if you were to do this, all of you would eventually start going slower on one side. You can't really fake this. I said do this and make one side go slower, you go. <laughs> now it's very, very hard to fake neurology, isn't it? Okay? But you would fatigue on one side faster than the other. That's referred to as claudication. So whether you want to do Rus's test, whether you want to call it East test, I don't care as long as you understand what's going on. Does that make sense? So if we have claudication on this side, <coughs> you should think that brain is ipsilateral to vasomotor tone. So an increased claudication on this side is an increase in sympathetics, which means I have one of two things, right? Either decreased output of brain on left side or decreased output of PMRF on left side. You with me? Yes? Okay. So what you're doing is you're building up your evidence, right? So now if we add a motor test to the picture, I can be, begin to identify do I have brainstem or do I have a cortical level of dysfunction, right? So is it pretty easy for you guys to have your patients do this? Pretty simple, okay? Now you could also do blood pressure. If we have an increase in blood pressure on the left side compared to the right. What does that mean to us? Ipsilateral or contralateral dysfunction? 
ipsilateral. Again, the predominant output of the brain is ipsilateral. Never has been, never will be contralateral. Okay? So left side brain controls what? Left side autonomics, left side pontal measure tick formation, right? Left side tone. The only part that's going contralateral is that little bit for what? Volitional function. Right? You keep my nail hands really volitional, it's what? Your arms. Because now if you look at your patient, you simply separate her arms, everything else is midline, isn't it? Homologous what? Column 3, 4, 6, 12. You guys get that? So in other words, as the infant begins to raise their head up, and through the first year of life begins to stand up, now you see cortical reorganization. Which means, for example, an infant two or three months of age may have equal cortical organization of hand and foot. Why is that? They're not walking yet, right? But as they mature, the legs become more for what? Bipedalism, i.e. more cerebellum and pontine, while the hands become more what? Cortical and volitional. So cerebellum, pontal, medullary, down. More non-volitional. Arms, more what? Volitional and cortical. So when you do things with the hands, it's a good way to start assessing what? Cortex. When you do things with your legs, it's a much better way to start assessing what? Cerebellum and... Because when we look at rhomboencephalon, rhomboencephalon brings in what? Cerebellum, pons, and medulla. Oftentimes referred to as vital brain. Okay? So two things real quick. As brain matures from very, very early on, one of the first things it does is to inhibit what? Flexors. So what are you observing for as chiropractors in your patient population, regardless of age? That return to flexion, right? Either one, they didn't develop enough to dampen flexors, or two, they've acquired a flexor hypersensitive due to sedentary activity. Fair enough? What's the next thing the developing brain does? Autonomics. Does what? Inhibits sympathetics. And it does that via what? The excitation of inhibitory pathways to your sympathetics. So where is the inhibitory neuron located? Caudal brainstem. Where is the activation located? Cerebellum and cortex. Now, mesencephalon activates inhibition of inhibitory neuron. So, mesencephalon is very old. When you follow your vesicles, prosencephalon and bromencephalon further differentiated. Mesencephalon did not. So, mesencephalon being very old is very limbic related. So, very excitatory to your what? Sympathetics. So how does mesencephalon excite your sympathetics? By inhibiting caudal brainstem. So rostral brainstem does what to lower brainstem? Inhibits it. So when you inhibit an inhibitory neuron, what is the output of your IML? Excitation. So now picture this. Here's cortex, primarily frontal lobe, and here's cerebellum, doing what? Converging on pontal medullary tick formation. To do what? To inhibit the IML. So when you look at cerebellum, how do you evaluate cerebellum clinically? You look at someone's what? Posture and gait, right? Because we have postural hypotonia, that's dysfunction of your cerebellar vestibular system, is it not? You guys kind of good with that? Then of course, as frontal lobe becomes dysfunctional, you see a return towards spasticity. So when you see the patient who is like this, we say, oh, that's cerebral palsy. You just say, well, it's not really cerebral palsy. It's a decreased activation of inhibitory pathways. So if you take the cerebral palsy patient and you raise their head up, all of a sudden their spasticity does what? Diminishes. Because you don't raise their head up, you can't activate the homologous column or your frontal pontine centers. So see how poor is it for you to get an adjustment and go sit and read 
you're booked for another couple hours. Is that very effective on our part? No. In other words, if you probably had your druthers, you'd get some an adjustment and send them for a walk around the track, right? Of course, the last thing you want to do is get adjusted, then go sit down, right? And then lean back to the thorax and have your head come forward and flex posture reflexogenically. That would kind of be anti-chiropractic, wouldn't it? Or say, hey, you know what, got adjusted. Better go lay down for a while. Is that what you want for your patients? In other words, they've been adjusted. In other words, if you've removed it, so that they can't move, what do you need to do now? Move. But that doesn't mean lay down and roll around on the floor, right? It means use your weight bearing lower extremities and move somewhere, right? So now, if we understand brain is going to inhibit your flexors, and now you've got a proximal distal orientation. So if we wanted to assess cortex, we could go to the very, very distal muscle group of extensor or flexor origin. Which would it be? Got lost in the question? Okay, sorry. So if you're going to check the pyramidal system, what would you check? You would check your most distal extensors. In other words, I would not check the tricep, I would not check the quads. I would go as distal as I can. Why? Because the flexors are going to be under what? Volitional cortex. So any decrease in function here will show first where? In distal extensors. So if I have my patient go ahead and slide back just a little more. Scooch back just no mind. So if we did a pyramidal check, just kind of turn face a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Put your fingers up like this for me. So elbows into her side, fingers towards the ceiling, if you will. Now do your motor check, right? Index, right here, digital fingers, and say hold. And now press down. Okay? Now I'm pressing the same on both sides. But she can tell you she feels the weakness where? On her left side. Okay. Now what are my possible differentials here? We well, could say what nerve root innervates distal finger extensors, and please don't mess this one up. How about if I just tell you that we don't run C7. Okay? So C7 nerve root, or it could be what nerve possibly? It could be radial nerve. So now you got differentials. One, it could be ipsilateral cortex, it could be ipsilateral nerve root or peripheral nerve. Okay. Now what's the likelihood of having a C7 radiculopathy or a radial neuropathy? Not so much. Fairly unlikely. Right? But it doesn't mean you can't go through your differentials, right? And you thought it was C7, then you simply go across here and do what? Check wrist what? Flexion. Pretty simple. If you thought it was radial nerve, also go ahead and check what? Break your radialis. In other words, you can check another muscle group to confirm that, right? So, if we have this pyramidal weakness, okay, is this ipsy or contra cortex? Ipsy lateral. Now, can we also go ahead and confirm that with a claudication test? So, claudication on the left side and a pyramidal weakness on the left side. How should we then manage this patient? Left side stimulation? <laughs> don't guess. I don't want you to guess anymore, right? You should realize that it's left side output of brain, if you will, is being compromised. So the question becomes, how do you stimulate the left side of your parietal cortex? Now just go through your lobes, right? So if we say parietal cortex, because as chiropractors, for the most part, at least for a lot longer, we're still what? Thank you. Hands on. Chiropractic, right? Now, if you're going to serve your patients, now you have kind of two things to look at. You have that which is midline, right, older, and that which is more lateral and newer, okay? So where do you think you have the greatest receptor population? Midline, okay? So keep in mind, axial always precedes appendicular from a clinical perspective. So the crime would be if I only did things with her arm or her leg and let her spine continue to do what? Degenerate. That's called pre-spondylosis, which progresses into what? Spondylosis, which is also known as myelopathy. 
right? Very, very important. You guys have to understand that. You cannot have spondylosis without myelopathy. So when you start seeing DJD on film, what do you know about the underlying integrity of the spinal cord? Morphometrically, spinal cord is degenerating. Now, what usually precedes degenerative change on x-ray? Loss of joint motion, right? And what do we call that entire practice? So how much of a crime would it be if you decided not to remove subluxation of the spine and only did some things with the arms or legs? That would be tragic, wouldn't it? Okay. So then go and palpate. Whatever your technique might be, that's not for this discussion right now. Identify your subluxation. Now, what if you found subluxation on the left side? Because here's one of the hard things. Many of our techniques are rotational in contact, aren't they? In other words, you take a spinous contact, you take a body contact, you take a TDP contact, which means you're rotational, right? So if you're going to take a contact, where would you want that contact to be in order to have the best effect on the left cortex? On the right. So yeah, now you kind of got to work out in your mindset, right? I prefer to use a couple of reduction, set up the joint, right? Now again, you should work on your technique to have a rostral caudal orientation, right? So you have more receptors, closer to the spine you go, and you have more receptors the more rostral you go. So there are more receptors in the suboccipital complex than there are at C4, C5, C6. But the receptors that are in the suboccipital complex are muscle spindles, right? Which drive primarily what tissue? What part of your brain is driven primarily by muscle spindles? Before that, cerebellum. That's why it's called the spinal what? Cerebellar tracts. Right? Then at C4, C5, C6, the apex of your cervical lordosis is the greatest concentration of joint mechanoreceptors. That's why right, the neural tube first fuses at what level? C4. Fourth cervical somite. So there you have the greatest concentration of joint receptors. Now, did you ever think in reality it would be that important to use a chiropractor? <coughs> you probably did when you were taking it, right? But there can be a lot of chiropractic pearls there, can't there? Because you'd be surprised how many doctors have no clue about what I just described to you. And because they don't understand that, they don't really understand what you do as a chiropractor. But if the chiropractor doesn't understand it, we all lose, right? Okay? So if you choose to make an osseous adjustment, right, look at your COC1, C2, or C4, 5, and 6, right? Most of your x-ray text will show you that BJD occurs most commonly at what levels? Which means where are you most subluxated? The same way that you should have a lordosis. So if you have your straight neck, are you on your way to spinal myelopathy? So fix it now. Just fix it. If you don't know how to get these upper tries, or come find me or get it done. The very worst thing you can do is graduate with a straight reversing curve, right? Or worse, a degenerating one, right? So in this pyramidal weakness, how would you define pyramidal weakness? Give you some discussion. Now, how will you walk away from this discussion? So, what is pyramidal weakness? Okay, so pyramidal weakness would be a decrease in extensor tone in the distal what? Fingers. And we could also even do what? Toes. Right? So now when you go to your examination form, you write down parameter weakness, you're going to have to say right or left. And if you say the right side, then you are telling someone that they have a brain weakness on their right side. Right? You say it's a left parameter weakness. So now how you identify the test and procedure is what sets up the care plan, right? So you say you did Bruce or claudication maneuvers or East test, if you will. Now you're also working to do what? Confirm that. Now, if we wanted to add blind spot mapping or peripheral visual fields, we could further cortex versus brainstem, couldn't we? Have you guys done peripheral visual fields yet? Okay. So what should your peripheral visual field be to begin with? One Say again? Yeah, I didn't say anything about blind spot. I said visual field. Should be good? Okay. 
<laughs> should be way out here. Okay, so how far away out there should it be? 170 degrees. Okay, so you want 180 degrees, right? Because you're chiropractors. Medicine accepts 170. In other words, so when you sit and do this, right, you put your thumbs out here with different color tape on, whatever you're going to do, right, and look straight ahead. If the person sees their left thumb here and their right thumb here, then how do you interpret This is called peripheral visual confrontation. They have a decrease in their left temporal field of vision. By how much? Not how many, just tell me. Okay, well here's 90. You're in the middle of that. What's half of 90? All right, there you go. Now, if you use a Cartesian system, okay. Now we're about okay. three kilometers. Say again, three kilometers. There you go. <laughs> so see, you guys have to do some of this information, right? So if you're going to go kind of rough, because for the most part, you don't have the technology and instrumentation to really do this, right? But you should be able to go 0, 90, 180. You could go 0, 45, 90, 135, 180. So you should get good at this, right? So then someone has diminished temporal field of vision of 25 degrees, 1, 2, 45 degrees. That would tell you that the problem is located where? In the brainstem or the cortex? Where do you perceive your visual field? In your brainstem or your cortex? Cortex. Good, cortex. Now, which side do you perceive your left temporal field of vision? Right. The right side. So if you had a reduced temporal field of vision on the left, and you had a left parietal weakness. Where is the problem? Both the problem. God, that was quiet. You want it to all match up easy, don't you? It's better that way. Okay? Well, that wouldn't be cortical, would it? That would be what? Brainstem. Now, if you had a large left temporal field of vision discrepancy, and a right parietal weakness, that would correspond to what? To the right cortex. How is the first one brainstem? Okay, so the first one brainstem because we have the output expression of what? Tone. So tone will always precede vision warning. Okay. Okay? And the path we haven't done what? Dexate and activate muscle cortex. So that's kind of the fun part about it, right? So you have to kind of ask yourself which is going to preset the other one. Right? Yes, left brainstem. A lot like doing our doll's eye from way back when. Our oculocephalic or our doll's eye, right? Now you have fun. So here's what you guys need to kind of start developing. Why do you do an examination in the first place? In your notes somewhere. Oh, I'm such a sweetheart. I'm glad they're out of class together. So she says to rule out things. So this is the 75 hour exam, right? Because how many tests and labs and images do we order to rule out all the possible things that she could have wrong with her? Be a lot. Right? That's kind of like the person who starts the differential after they do a history and after an exam. If you wait until after your history and after your exam to do a differential, you just waste the patient's time and your time, right? When does your differential start? Not the history. Well, but if you watch them, sometimes that's called stalking. It's kind of really awkward. <laughs> and if you're busy watching them, that means you have a pretty slow practice. Because you should be somewhere else with the patient, right? But it starts when you first get an idea of why they're in your office. Say again? Main complaint or reason for visit, right? In other words, I've had people kind of show up and say, well, hi, welcome to Dr. Hell's office. What are you here for? Dr. John says I should be here. And that's all they could give me. <laughs> they had to call a chiropractor, like, what's going on? Oh, I just know that you see they had everything going on. Because sometimes what happens is they have all this stuff kind of going on, and it can be kind of scary and intimidating, right? So we get kind of paired up with someone who might have a better angle how to kind of start sifting through this, right? But now go back. Why do you do an examination? Say again? Okay. I'm working hard to keep my tone down. How you try it? We don't do it to rule things out, otherwise we waste time. How many of you have ever seen someone who had lab work that came back that was normal? How about images that came back normal? MRI is normal. So we don't really do things, and this is going to be, and again, let this be between me and you for right now, okay? So you don't do an examination to rule things out. A patient comes to you hoping that you know what's wrong with them. So it should be to kind of confirm what? Confirm what you think is going on. 
So you do test and procedures to confirm. So if I thought she had a cortical deficit, what would I do? Exactly. Do you see how that works? So I probably don't need to do a straight leg raise, but I think it's a cortical issue. I probably don't need to give a born with questionnaire, but I think it's a cortical issue. In other words, if someone's in pain, how does it affect their cognitive function? So why would you ever give a patient a pain-based questionnaire to fill out when they're in pain? Does that make sense to anyone? It does. <laughs> so if someone was in pain, the very last thing you would give them would be what? A pain-based questionnaire. Because how do you feel when you're hurting and someone gives you a stack of paperwork to fill out? You go, great, thank you so much. Can I have more, please? And they always give you full, complete sentences, right? In other words, you might as well have done what? Because the first thing does, pain does, is reduce your frontal lobe function. So what do you think is the effect of pain on extensor motor tone? But see, pain doesn't diminish your primal tone. Pain diminishes what? Cortical function. In other words, you don't treat pain. You treat the person. So if she has a pyramidal weakness on this left side and an increase in claudication on this left side, and you identify that she does in fact have a left cortical dysfunction, then you put together a care plan to do what? Resolve that. You don't chase her pain. You don't go, oh, what kind of pain did you have? How long have you had this pain? Does this pain rate? Whatever. <laughs> You're not pain doctors. You are what? Chiropractors. Right? right? But if your mindset gets so focused on pain, then who suffers? The patient does. Right? Now again, if she claudicates on this left side, what do you know about the output expression of the IML? Is it high or low? IML, you guys go with that term? Okay, intermediate allows it will be higher, right? And so your IML is a pre ganglionic neuron and what aspect of your, uh, excuse me, of your, I'll just say, your adrenal is also considered to be postganglionic? The adrenal medulla. So when you fire the IML, you monosynaptically fire the what? The adrenal medulla. And what's the primary output expression of adrenal medulla? Epinephrine. And what's the effect of epinephrine on peripheral nociceptors? Sensitize them. So people who have chronic pain, or actually have chronic activation of the IML, have chronic pain. You get that? You don't get pain and then have chronic IML. You get that. So when you activate your IML, you then sensitize, sensitize peripheral nociceptors in your entire body. Which means now people start to have pain, but there's been no injury. The tree limb didn't fall on her. She didn't have a car accident. Gosh, I don't know why she hurts. It must be all on her what? Here's your anxiolytic antidepressant drug. Now, how many of you right now, be honest with you, how many of you right now know someone who did not have trauma or an accident, but has a type of pain syndrome and is being treated with antidepressants and anxiolytics? Do you see why you have got to get this information and do something with it? You can't just sit around and take tests, right? You've got to be able to put this together and someone says, why are you doing an examination? I do an examination to identify where I think the level of dysfunction is in my patient. Because if I can identify where the problem is, then I can successfully do what? Mm -hmm. So why do you think we fail in the treatment of pain? Because we don't know what's causing it. And so this is why we have things called pain killers. Don't know what's wrong with you. Here, take this drug to block the transmission. In other words, the problem still what? Still exists. So the person who first starts out here simply having increased claudication on one side with a pyramidal weakness eventually develops what else? In other words, there's a rostral caudal order to things. What do you hear in this section in here? Again, elevated IML, right? 
Increase heart. What does it mean to you clinically? In other words, it's got to make clinical sense. That's called fatigue. How many of you right now know someone who suffers fatigue? Adrenal exhaustion. Right? But they have elevated heart rate. Why elevated heart rate? 